The Royal Story Box Podcast. Young, Young Adult, Adult Edition. Edition. Hi everybody and welcome along to episode 2 of the Foil Storybooks Podcast 2017. This week is hosted by me, Ben. And me, Grace. We snuck up to the 6th floor of Foil's flagship store to get some peace and quiet away from all the shoppers, but you may occasionally hear some people floating around in the background. This is the place to catch up on all the fantastic events happening at the 2017 Foil Storybooks Festival. So over the next 10 minutes or so, Grace and I will let you in on all the festival secrets. For the last weekend of Storybooks, we're celebrating teen fiction with a fantastic young adult weekender. Coming up later in the show, we sit in on a fabulous panel with authors Alwyn Hamilton and Laura Eve, who discuss the role of feminism in young adult fiction. But first, let's go straight over to see what our reporters found out at the Creative Writing Workshop led by young adult author Olivia Lavez. Taking inspiration from her latest book, The Circus, Olivia taught our festival friends how to write from different perspectives. No, 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 not the boring kind you learn at school. The kind where you're teetering on the high wire, balancing on the unicycle, or even running around on stilts. Let's have a listen to see what we learnt. My killer line is, I can't just give up now. Hi, my name is Melissa and I'm at the Add Some Glitter to Your Creative Writing Workshop and we have been just writing our own short stories um, inspired by Olivia Levy's story called The Circus. My name is Olivia Levy and I'm the author of The Island and The Circus. My challenge was to teach people to add glitter to their writing. So it had to be all things glittery. So it involved constructing a hula hoop and uh, also playing lots of background noises like crowd noises to try and give writing prompts. She's the hero and I'm the villain and surprisingly both our stories are quite similar so it's quite easy to join them together and we're both doing the trapezing act and in the story I'm her best mate and I'm trying to come back and find her and bring her home because she's just stepped out of her old life that actually she could do so much more of it but she just wanted a new beginning. I like method writing which is a bit like method acting where you literally get into the head of the character by trying to experience the same things. We've discussed things like how to get over um, writer's block and um, how to generate ideas and things to keep the story interesting and tense to keep the reader wanting to read. You need a deck of cards and um, you write down so the numbers and you write down the spades, clubs, hearts and diamonds. You write down different scenarios for each of them. For example, one of them is there's a storm outside so you would add that into your writing. So it just, it really just gets you up. Then we use cinematic techniques like cutaways and match cuts to try and uh, weave in the protagonist and the villain's point of view and end on a cliffhanger. Well, I would suggest reading a lot of books first so you can get inspired in like what kind of genre of books you like. And go to workshops like this because it'll really help you with improving your writing skills and um, because it, it just like helps you, like, like how she said... Um, how to get over a writer's block so that could really help with um, when you're trying to write a story of your own and because not many books really tell you how to do that so I think workshops are quite good for that. When I wrote my first book The Island I actually lived only off porridge and coconut water for a week which was all I found in my caravan to try and be the castaway girl um, with limited food supplies so method right would be my tip. Lovely stuff Hey, Ben, seeing as we're on the topic of the circus, what's your favourite circus act? I think I'd have to say that it's the trapeze. Oh, wow, that's mine as well. Really? Yeah, you know, the other day, I actually almost fell off the trapeze. What? Anyway, enough with that circus silliness. It's time to carry on with the podcast. The Royal Story Box Podcast! Young Adult Adult Edition. Edition! Hello everybody, you're listening to the Storybox Podcast and this week is hosted by me, Grace. And me, Ben. Coming up, we head over to listen in on a talk panel with young adult authors, Orwin and Laura. But first, I've got an idea. The rest of the podcast will be discussing the role of feminism in young adult fiction. 
So why not kick it off with a quiz to test our knowledge of feminism and fiction? Sure, fire away! Okay, question one. Which famous actress, who starred in the film adaptation of the Harry Potter series, recently started the He For She campaign for gender equality? A. Helena Bonham Carter B. Ivana Lynch C. Julie Walters or D. Emma Watson Um, I'll have to go with D. Emma Watson Correct! I've got one for you. Which of these well-known female writers hasn't used a male pen name for her work? A. Virginia Woolf B. Emily Brunty C. J.K. Rowling D. They all have Um, I think they all have. That is wrong. It's actually A, Virginia Woolf. She hasn't used a male pen name. Next question, please. Malala Yousafzai, a teenage Pakistani political campaigner, released her autobiography, I Am Malala, in 2012 after being shot for what reason? A, going shopping unaccompanied. B, not wearing traditional clothing. C. Writing a blog about girls' rights to education or D. Walking in the street with a man she wasn't related to I've actually seen a movie um, about Malala so I actually know for sure that it's C. Writing a blog about girls' rights to education Well done Okay, last question Where I go, I go because I choose to Which female protagonist from a YA novel said these words? A. Tris Pryor in Insurgent B. Clary Frey in The Mortal Instruments C. Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games or D. Hazel Grace Lancaster in The Fault in Our Stars Well, I thought it was Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games but then I thought harder and I realised it must be A. Tris Pryor in Insurgent Yay, you got it right! Yay! Well done! Phew, some tricky questions there Let's take a listen to the lively discussion and Q&A session with authors Alwyn Hamilton and Laura Eve. I'm Livia and we're at a YA talk on feminism hosted by Samantha Shannon, including the uh, acclaimed YA authors Alwyn Hamilton and Laura Eve. And some of the audience had questions about the talk and here they are. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. Um, first hand up for a question gets T-shirt. As a bookseller, how do you think we could help male readers get more involved in YA? As I sell a lot of your books, hand sell three of them at work, and sometimes the minute I save a female main character, but the boys who read it or the men who are even picking it up, and the parents won't pick them up. I've had a number of parents and grandmothers who go, oh, no, no, it's for a boy, and I get really mad all of a sudden and say, why does that matter? Just pick up the book. How do you think we could help change that and change opinions and get people reading? I have an answer to that that I don't necessarily like because I think it's kind of sad, but could you just tell them the story without telling them the character? And then once they start reading, maybe they'll be like, wow, it's a woman. I hate to say it because I, I've, I think if I tried to get my little brother to read something that had a girl main character, he'd be like, oh, it's a girl. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm a girl, but you still hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> I think booksellers do a terrific job just putting books into people's hands generally. And it's especially great when you see like, you know, tables of women's fiction. I see that quite a lot now, which is lovely. Um, but yeah, maybe it just needs to be an emphasis on the story, a sneaky way of introducing women into boys' books. I mm. had a, a friend who was a bookseller who found that she said that she would be able, like a little boy would come into the shop looking for a book and she would be able to hand sell him something that had a female character in it and then 10 minutes later parents would come in saying I'm looking for something for my little boy same age as the one she just sold it to and she showed to them their first reaction was oh well it's got a girl on the cover or it's got a girl in it and it wasn't at all coming from the kids themselves it was coming from the adults so maybe it's a case of sort of making them sort of question their first impulse why would you in a non- as non-aggressive way as possible why would you not want your son to read about girls, you know, because that's half the population. Yeah. I had someone. And it's also you if it's you're gonna, the mom. Yeah, like, it's, like, yeah, it's, it's you. It's you. It's it's he's going to have to interact with them sooner or later. Um, or would you buy? You know, would you object to buying Harry Potter with for your daughter? Yeah, you know, it's, it's the other thing. Um, if your characters were here on the panel, uh-huh. what would they have to say about the subject? I think Amani would probably. I mean, she probably wouldn't be familiar with the word feminism because it's a modern word, but in terms of the concept, I think she would probably say, 
it's ridiculous that she's not considered just as good as the boys in her world uh, because you know it was really important for me to give her a skill that was something that she could sort of something concrete that she could revert to so that when there were boys around her saying well you're not as good as me she could be like well I demonstrably am I'm in fact better at you better than you at shooting you know it was something really concrete that that equalized her and the boys so I think that would be what she would revert to she'd probably be like if anyone if any boys here can outshoot me then we can talk about a lack of feminism <laughs> um, but yeah so I think that's what we should probably say what would River say what would River say that's a good question I'm not sure but I know what the graces would say go on <laughs> The graces would be like, feminism, really? Because we kind of rule the world right now. So I don't think that that's necessary. I mean, there are male characters, but it's a very matriarchal family. The, the mother is really what drives a lot of what's going on. And um, witchcraft, is, as you said earlier, has always been incredibly feminist. It's always been about women. And so I think that they would consider the talk redundant in their world. <laughs> to me, it just seems like LGBT issues seems like the last big taboo that's not really... I personally I haven't really seen it being explored in YA books all very well. I was just wondering why you think that is, because I mean, I think sometimes maybe people object when they think, oh, that's too risque, you shouldn't go there. I guess for a lot of teenagers, maybe then that's when they're kind of first maybe experiencing those issues or when they feel like that's the most difficult time to talk about it. So I've read some books where it feels like a romantic plot has almost been retrofitted to kind of make it appeal. And I wonder if maybe you've ever heard from like editors, they say like, oh, we don't want that kind of relationship in a book for this age or... I remember seeing, yet again, someone said it better than me, it was around the time of one of the Percy Jackson books that Rick Riordan and said that he'd gotten some backlash from parents for including a gay character because they were like, well, that's too adult. That's an adult theme. Da, 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 da. And he said, well, you've never objected to my, you know, these younger characters having straight relationships. So I don't think it should be excluded from from kids' books. Uh, I think it's there's two types, really. There's a lot of contemporary books that are issue books about it uh, still, which I think are still important, like Simon versus the Homo Sapien Agenda and things like that. And then there are the ones where it's just incidental, like it's sort of in a world where it's okay. And that's I think that's something that fantasy can do very well, a little bit like not having to wait, make a world misogynistic. Just because your world resembles you know, a medieval world it doesn't mean it has to be homophobic, so it can just be like, oh, and these two characters happen to be gay or bi or whatever it might be. And I think we need both uh, because there are going to be people who need sort of a book about tackling it and there are people who are going to be relieved to find a book that it's like, oh God, thank God it's not about having to tackle who I am. It's just, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have issue you books and then books that just seamlessly integrate LGBT exactly. people into narrative. And I think, yeah, we do still need both, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, I actually disagree with you but with the caveat that I and we are at the sort of forefront of the industry so to me it feels like that is happening a lot actually but it might be that I'm talking about books that are coming out now or or about to come out or I'm talking with writers who are doing it just as a matter of course now but you're not seeing the fruits of that you know yet because his books won't be out for another 18 months or whatever Um, but there is For me, and it's the same with racial diversity and all of those different um, diversity, you know, any any kind of other, that's happening a lot in YA and I think it happens first in YA before any other type of fiction, always. And I think that's great. And it's still a very murky and occasionally conflicted area, but at least those conversations are happening and it's forcing every single you know, straight white writer to go, why do I keep defaulting to that then? Okay, that's interesting. Maybe I need to challenge that in myself. Why industry is actually quite small and we all kind of know each other and I cannot think of one writer who doesn't have that conversation all the time, actually. Um, and it is that thing of it just being incidental rather than being an issue thing because, you know, you want someone who is that um, or who identifies with that um, other culture or other way of being to own that story and then it, the onus is on people like us to just include it as a matter of course because it is because it's just everywhere in the world I mean just to be kind of true and reflective of society that's what we should do and I think it's happening okay on that note um, I'm going to close um, but thank you so much for coming and can we give a big round of applause to Owen and Law and that's about it from us today Thank you to everyone that took part in today's podcast episode and a special thank you to all of you that have been listening. Be sure to keep an eye and ear out for Storybox Festival 2018.
Head over to foils.co.uk slash storybox for details on all events and workshops that have taken place all over the past few weeks across the stores in London, Birmingham, Bristol and Chelmsford. You've been listening to the Storybox Podcast 2017, hosted by us, Grace and Ben. Don't forget to check out both podcast episodes over on SoundCloud and YouTube. Goodbye! Happy reading! <laughs>